Hey everyone, my name is Billy Roll, and I'm going to start doing this series of online journals about my time at the Waikiki Aquarium. I am a student aquarist at the Waikiki Aquarium, and I attend UH Manoa, um, which is University of Hawaii at Manoa campus, and that's actually how I got my job at the aquarium as a student aquarist. Um, I work on, well, I used to work under the disease specialist, Wendy Lee, at the aquarium, and because of that, and because of the opportunity she gave me to work under her, I've gotten to work with a lot of really rare species, and today I'll be talking about one of the rarest ones we have at the aquarium, which is the peppermint angelfish, which is known as Centropygi boilii, or also Paracentropygi boilii. You may or may not have heard about our peppermint angelfish that we have at the Waikiki Aquarium. It's pretty special. It's one of only two captive specimens known in the world right now, and we're the only public aquarium that actually has one on display. So pretty much right now we're the only place you're going to be able to see one. The other peppermint angelfish is owned by a private collector in Japan. I get a lot of questions about this fish, mostly because it is so rare and there was a lot of publicity about it when it first got to the aquarium. Um, I'm here to answer some of the questions that I've gotten about the fish and also share some of the special things that you would not get to hear otherwise. Um, I can't share everything that we've had happen at the aquarium and I mean, a lot of them are trade secrets that we can't share with everybody yet, but some of the stuff I think is just valuable to other people to know. I mean, collaborative science, one of the most important parts is sharing your work and sharing what you know so that other people can build off of it, and that's one of our goals at the aquarium. We're really conservation-minded, and if anything I share with you can help you with any fish you might have, even if it's not a super rare species, um, a lot of the things are similar that you may run into and the problems that you might run into and how to solve them. Um, one of the questions that we get a lot of the time at the aquarium is, why is this fish worth $30,000? Um, it is and it isn't worth $30,000. We've had people offer upwards of $30,000, um, private collectors. I mean, I don't know many people who have that kind of cash, but some people do, and they'd like to spend it on that fish. Um, the aquarium is not selling that fish. It is not for sale at all. It was actually given to us as part of the, um, by Rich Pile, a collector. And he was collecting species for the Moreo Biocode project. Uh, Moreo Biocode project is a project that is working on databasing all of the genetic information from pretty much every species in French Polynesia they can get their hands on. And this fish was collected at over 300 feet. Um, means you had to go down more than 300 feet underwater to get this fish. That's greater than most regular scuba depths. That's one of the reasons why this fish is so expensive. Um, you have to go pretty deep. You have to be a rebreather certified diver in order to go down that far. The equipment and the training is not cheap at all. You also have to be part of a research cruise. And so they sent out a ship with a bunch of research divers who went down to collect these species. And when they found the peppermint angelfish, it was brought up and there were a series of really fortunate events for our aquarium. They ended up sending it to us. But when it dies, when it does die, um, that fish will still be sent to the Smithsonian Institute for genetic databasing. So they'll run tests and it it will not be lost to science. I mean, it is a rare fish and we do want to keep um, as much of that information as we can. And the Maria Bioco project is going to be open to the public. Um, but those are some of the factors that did lead to the fish's incredible value. Is that it's not that there aren't more fish out there, because there are, they did see multiple um, peppermint angelfish when they went down and were diving in French Polynesia. But, um, it's just the amount of effort you have to have. You have to have all the divers trained. You have to be able to set up a cruise. You have to be able to go out and get them. Uh, one of the problems that we do have with most fishes that are brought up from a depth of, I mean, pretty much any depth greater than 30 feet, is you can have gas bladder problems. And what that is is um, a fish's swim bladder is kind of like a balloon in there, like inside of them. And what happens is the there's a set amount of gas in there, but as you bring a fish up from a certain depth, all of that gas is being compressed down into a small, tight bubble. But as the pressure decreases, all of that gas is going to expand. And a lot of the time, if you bring a fish up too quickly from depth, it can expand faster than the fish can expel the gas, and that can actually lead to the fish dying and having the swim bladder rupture. Um, this happens with a lot of fishes that are brought up from a pretty good depth. Uh, one of the ways that you deal with this problem is aspiration. And that means you take a hypodermic needle and you stick the fish on the side of the swim bladder and you let a lot of that gas escape. So you're just providing it 
a direct outlet so that all that expanding gas can escape without damaging the fish. Right? You do have some mechanical injury. I mean, you are poking a hole in the organ of a fish, but this is a pretty common method. Uh, you rarely lose fish from it, but it was something for us to watch at the aquarium. Um, when it was in our quarantine systems, you just have to really keep an eye on it. Uh, like, I mean, you punctured the fish. Could have secondary bacterial infections, and we medicate preemptively. I'm um, just kind of a shotgun treatment where you treat any fish that you've had to aspirate. Uh, you do this with pretty much any quarantine animal. You treat them even before you see signs of disease. Prevention is the best cure. Um, Besides that, the biggest challenge we ran into with keeping the peppermint angelfish was probably feeding. Um, it's one of those things where not all fishes are going to accept every food you offer them. And most of our fish at the aquarium are fed uh, a variation of the same diet. So we have a standard flake food, which is pretty much the same thing you can buy at a pet store. It's just regular fish flake food. Uh, we also have uh, gel food. Our gel food is a special recipe of the aquarium. It's gelatin with spirulina powder several other different, I mean, like vegetables, fish, squid that we blend together and pour out into sheets so that you can chop it up to any size that you need for any species that you need to feed. The third food that we have at the aquarium is mysis, uh, which are usually freshwater mysid shrimp, and those, I mean, it's pretty standard, you can get at most pet stores. Um, just a bunch of little frozen shrimps that you can throw into the water for the fish, and the cubes will dissolve, and you'll have a whole bunch of little shrimp in the water that the fish can eat. Um, we did offer our peppermint angelfish all of those foods at first. Um, it won't accept any of them. It took about two weeks before we did find a food that it would eat. Uh, a fish doesn't need to eat every day, but when it's been a while, um, anything more than a week really, it, it's not real concern because it's still stress for the fish. It's a wild animal and you're giving it a lot of food that it's never seen before. So a lot of the time it doesn't even know that it is food. That it sees. But the one food that we did have a lot of success with, and since that time, we've actually had a lot of success with getting most angelfishes that we've gotten into the aquarium to eat this first. Um, it's a food by Brightwell Aquatics. I think it's called their marine pellet. It looks like a liver treat, like you would give a dog. I took a section of that and soaked it in angel elixir mixed with um, amino omega. And angel elixir and amino omega are two products that Brightwell Aquatics provides. They're food additives, so you just soak whatever food you're going to feed the fish in that, and then you offer it to them. Um, the thing with the peppermint angelfish is it was a really skittish fish at first. I mean, it kind of makes sense. It came from 300 feet underwater, and all of a sudden it's in a little tank. Uh, bright lights everywhere and people walking past. So um, with that one, we couldn't actually stare in, like stare into the tank and watch the fish eat. It would get too skittish, but if we stood to the side... We could see into the tank and we could see that was picking up the marine pellet food, which was a really big success for us. As soon as we got it eating, everybody just kind of breathed the sigh of relief. It was like, okay, like, wow, like, thank you. Like, thank you, fish. Thank you for saving our jobs by eating. Um, the next food that we did offer it was uh, another Rightwell Aquatics food. It was a marine algae pellet. Uh, it looks kind of like sprinkles you would put on ice cream, but green and they smell like seaweed. And we chopped it up and threw it in the tank as well, and the fish ate that, and that pretty much became the staple of its diet for a while, was those marine algae pellets. And then eventually it did transition into eating small-sized Hapari shrimp. Um, after that, it started accepting pretty much every food we gave it. So, I mean, that was one of the tricks that we did at the aquarium to try and get our fish to start eating. Um, I can't share every little thing that we do at the aquarium, because some of our tricks are still trade secrets and we're not allowed to share everything. But if you get the chance to, you should stop by the Waikiki Aquarium, check out the fish. It is in our reef machine exhibit. If you'd like to actually see videos of the fish, um, there is a video, I believe it's on YouTube now, with Dr. Andy Rossiter, our director of the aquarium, and he's talking a lot about the fish and the species and a little bit more about its history. If you guys have any questions or would like any advice on keeping some of these rare fishes, I may not have the answers. I mean, I'm still a student, I'm still learning. Just kind of doing this journal for fun and to keep a record for myself, but also it might help you. And I can probably direct you in, you know, kind of the right direction if you have a question I can't answer. Um, yeah, stay tuned and I'll hopefully be posting up more of these videos about different species that I've worked with. Have a good one, guys.